Welcome, Juliet McGraw, Community and Cultural Education Director for the Friends of the Richfield National Wildlife Refuge. I'm so pleased to introduce our guest for our second series offering for you this summer, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield. Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield comes to us from Oregon State. She is a scholar in indigenous time, traditional ecological knowledge, and indigenous response to climate change. This is our second time welcoming her back to the Cathopoda Plank House series, and I'm very excited for her to share new research with us today. Samantha comes from us, to, from the Siletz people out on the Pacific coast, though they definitely traded up and down into the interior peoples. There are many Siletz people that I know today that have invested their time and energy in making me a better person, and Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield is one of them. I'm so pleased that they get to share more time with us today. And without much further ado, I do want to say that we owe a big thanks for the Cultural Resources Department from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who has given us a generous infusion of funds this year. And so they are basically our sponsor for the Cathopodal Plank Out series for this year. And so I wanted to give a big shout out to Ain and Raymond and Virginia Parks for supporting the Cathopodal Plank House, the Friends of the Richfield National Wildlife Refuge, and this year's series in its entirety, which is Indigenous Scholarship scholarship, leadership, and research. And then of course, Dr. Chisholm Hatfield embodies all of those things as well as a huge spirit of generosity. So thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing any feedback on, on our presentations and this one and ones in the future. Thank you so much. Sheila, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield wa amnishi. Shita du dene chinook salagi. Hi, I'm Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield. I am enrolled with the Confederated Tribes of Salets Indians, and I am from the Chitutni and Chinook Bands, and I am also Cherokee. So it's my honor to be here today, and I want to thank um, the Friends of Ridgefield and um, everyone, spe specifically Juliet, for arranging this wonderful series of talks and inviting me here today, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I am seated within Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, which is seated within Oregon State University. Um, Oregon Climate Change Research Institute is a group of um, individuals who specialize in climate change issues and events that are all tied to climate change issues. Um, our legislature here in Oregon and our governor decided that they needed a group that would facilitate these these issues and look into climate change and um, potential effects and ramifications and a clearinghouse and research and all kinds of things tied to climate change here in the Pacific Northwest. So we do all of those things. We have a lot of collaborators up and down um, the coast and in other university systems, um, inland over into Western Montana in Idaho, um, uh, you know, California, Washington. So we do a lot of collaboration work and we work with a lot of tribal entities as well. So that's a very exciting um, thing that I do. So my specialization is traditional ecological knowledge looking at climate change through that traditional ecological knowledge aspect. How does that work? What are we looking at? You know, how does it change? How do we know these things? So that's what I'm gonna be talking a little bit about today. And I would encourage you if you are interested in working with ACRI or finding out more or utilizing our services as a clearinghouse for information to contact us. And I'll have um, the information at the end where you can do so. So I am enrolled with the Siletz tribe. The Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians is on the west side of the state near um, the Pacific Coast Ocean there. We are about 20, 25 miles inland from a little place called Depot Bay. And um, that is just, Depot Bay is just north of Newport. So it's right here. Um, and where that little round mark is, is where our quote unquote reservation area is located. We don't typically have a reservation like um, most people think of reservations as a, a continuous land base that's 
you know, expansive, we have what's known as a checkerboard. And so we have little plots of land that have been given back to us and they're not in one contiguous area. These are all of our, we are a confederation tribe. So there are multiple bands and smaller tribes that were um, placed into a confederation by the federal government. So the federal government didn't recognize each of these bands or tribes, but these are now um, wrapped into our confederation. So like I said, I, I'm from the Chitutni and the Chinook, which is right up here, which expands down into Oregon. So I'm from those as well. I also have Kalapuya lines that, that are in my family. So we have an amalgamation of a whole bunch of different lineages, but these are the traditional homeland areas of those tribes that make up the Confederated Tribes of Salets. So what is traditional ecological knowledge? Some people have heard of it, some people haven't. And that's a, a really interesting aspect to look at, first of all, to build that foundation. So while we're looking at TEK, it's really important to remember that traditional ecological knowledge or TEK is a westernized term. And that term has been developed and created for all of these explanations for indigenous processes or behaviors. And that includes these patterns, these practices and the data systems that, that include and wrap into this overarching discipline. Um, and westernized science has a categorization, a categorization system, a taxonomies and labels and Latin names for things. Um, Western science loves to categorize and um, put things into groupings. But TEK didn't have that. There was no label for um, when these scientists, these Western scientists went into indigenous communities, these tribal entities, and were watching and noting what was happening. Primarily, this was the um, ecologists from the, you know, the discipline of ecology that went into tribal areas. Before that, anthropologists had been going in, but anthropology is based in language and a social science. And it was very, it was very easy for those anthropologists to describe in detail what native people were doing. On the flip side, ecology falls under biology. And for hard sciences, it's not as easy to describe. Um, like I said, Western science loves categorization and taxonomies and labels. And so there wasn't a label that could be easily placed on what was happening, all of these practices and behaviors that these ecologists were noticing. So out of that arose the term TEK and it's a, a westernized term that has been developed. It isn't an indigenous term that is used. It's been adopted. However, it is remaining a westernized science term that has been created. So as it's a westernized term, every tribal entity, every indigenous community is going to have their own definition for TEK because TEK is very individualistic and applies very differently to one ecosystem and one tribal entity than it does to another. So you can have tribal entities, tribal groups that are even five miles away from each other and their TEK definitions amongst themselves are going to be very different, different because of their practices and their cultural norms, but also because of the landscape that they access and utilize. So this was my, this is my definition that I created back in 2018. And usually TEK is attributed to indigenous populations. It's normalized here in the West for anything attributing to a behavior, a, a, a cultural norm, a practice, any kind, any kind of um, environmental practice, ecological knowledge that is associated with a tribal or indigenous population. So that's really key. And that is inclusive, inclusive of traditional knowledges, which is an overarching discipline and then evidenced through applications of tradition over a long standing period of time, usually 
those are the application and utilization of those knowledges. So if you're able to do that, if you're able to replicate those knowledges, that's the key. There are all kinds of ecological knowledges and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, there are different EKs. Um, some of these EKs, these ecological knowledges are actually documented and you're very aware of them, but you just don't know that you're aware of them. So this is a really nice uh, chart that NOAA came up with for their uh, fisheries project that they were doing. And it does outline to EK this uh, definition here by the, that came out of the Diné Cultural Institute in 95 is a fantastic one as well. This was a group of indigenous people who came up with this definition also that is overarching. Um, so that's a really wonderful is wonderful definition as well. There are multiple definitions and none of them are wrong. They're just very different and they apply to the area or region or ecosystem that it's associated with. So some of the other EKs that often get mixed up with TEK are in the um, local ecological knowledge, which can and sometimes is mixed up with citizen science now. Citizen science is a new term that has emerged and people are, are regularly using it. So local ec ecological knowledge often bridges the gap or you know melds into citizen science. Um, fishers ecological knowledge, local fix fishers knowledge, um, if somebody goes out into the ocean and goes out, out, um, you know, miles out, compared to people who stay closer to the shoreline and the ocean, those are very different systems and very different knowledges. Um, likewise, you have farmers ecological knowledge as well. And the farmer's almanac is a really good example of farmer's ecological knowledge. So this is a really classic example that you see every year and you hear about and, you know, the weather, weatherman or news station might reference the farmer's almanac. Um, this is a very classic example of also melding into local ecological knowledge. Um, a lot of people will contribute to this, even if they aren't farmers or, um, you know, communities can, can contribute information systems. But this has been heavily relied upon for generations and continues today. You know, you can find it, easily find it at bookstores or even in the grocery store, um, in your magazine racks. Um, this is a really nice example of farmer's ecological knowledge, but the differences between traditional ecological knowledge and the other EKs is that traditional ecological knowledge is usually three or more generations. It's not unheard of to have seven, eight, nine generations worth of knowledge that is passed down. Farmers ecological knowledge and local ecological knowledge are usually under three, usually two or less, but it can be three generations worth. Um, and that's a really key point because that's a long standing, traditional ecological knowledge is a long standing database. And it, while it is an oral database, it is a vetted system. It is critiqued, it's peer reviewed in the sense that our elders are our experts and those who are collecting the information will bring it back. And it's a round table discussion. We saw this you know, hunting parties will come back or fishing parties will come back and um, people will contribute to this ongoing database. And so when something seems like an outlier or not right or an oddity, then those experts, those elders will come together and say, mm, that doesn't seem like that fits. That's never happened before. Let's just kind of put a pin in it over here and watch it. And so that's really key to remember, you know, that critique, that editing of that ongoing oral documentation system is very, very highly refined. So native culture is rooted in the land. It's not something that is outstanding or connected only in certain circumstances. It's very much tied with the land. And you can see this is a, a Quinault 
traditional uh, canoe. This is a this is a salmon and a person that was um, depicted here. This one was it has been taken out of commission. This canoe has been taken out of commission. And is no longer um, you know operated, but this still remains very indicative. So RTEK in native communities is very, very illustrated amongst ourselves. It's not, it's very prominent, dis, prominently displayed. It's not set aside. It's not behind glass in some museum that's untouchable. It's very approachable. It's very day-to-day -day living and very accepted that that's the norm. And it's a, it's a reminder, almost like a daily reminder of um, in different aspects that this is us, we are the land and the land is us and we're rooted. There's a, a connection that cannot be broken. So this is in Salish Kootenai country. This is another example of this TEK that's very evident. Um, you've got the, this is a, a veterans memorial and um, you can see here uh, Salish Kootenai country, Salish Kootenai tribe has um, horses. They ha are known and have been known for their bison and they have a fantastic bison range there. But traditionally they are were, have been bison hunters as well. So you've got the bison that are flanking each end of this memorial and you have the names of the people, but you also have these horse, horse, horses with riders on them. And then of course the eagle, which is a sacred bird to us. And then underneath this, this lodge pole are teepee structures, um, which, you know, the, the poles that form your teepee structure. And these two are indicative. People often look at this and think, oh, that's beautiful. It's art, it's wonderful, and it is. And at the same time, it's very functional and it's teaching in a manner of um, non-overt information systems. So this is very subtle, but if you know what you're looking at, it's a reinforcement of those TEK values and what is needed to be known. So growing up with this information system is really vital. So looking at these poles, when you're making a teepee, you want these strong straight poles as much as possible. So you'll notice there aren't any intentionally, um, there are no markings on the poles, there are no um, texturing or any patterns or anything. It's looking, it's representative of those strong straight wooden poles that would be um, collected for a traditional teepee structure. So the land for us is really important. It's you know synonymous with our identity, with our culture and our history. This is a beautiful rendition of our longest walk or our trail of tears for the Confederated Tribes of Siletz. And this was commissioned by our tribe for, um, from Peggy O'Neill, the artist Peggy O'Neill, and she did a fantastic job. Um, we were rounded up and forced to walk from Southern Oregon all the way up the coastline. And there are still stories and documentations from families about their ancestors who talked about this line, this horizon line and what it was like, what the sand felt like, the consistency of you know, the wind, the, the velocity of the wind, the color of the ocean, um, how many rocks there were, what kind of rocks there were, um, looking at the horizon on the landscape gave them a sense of where they were and they were noting like a GPS system, what that landscape looked like. They were literally using the landscape as a map. So that was a really important thing to note. You can see people here looking out um, to the, the sea and looking and noticing where they were and how they, you know, the land was traversed and keeping that going, keeping that information going down generation after generation 
um, knowing that that landscape and what to expect and how it's changed. That's a really key part of it. It used to be like this, now it's like this. Here's a totem pole in uh, Tohola, Washington. This is Quinault country and in Washington state up um, north of Oregon. And this again shows TEK. This is a bear clan. You've got a canoe. So they're probably canoe journey people. Um, this is probably um, someone who works as you know a fisherman, does fishing for a living or has some tie to salmon or fish as a, as a resource, as a subsistence living or some connection with fish. They're probably very marine based. So another thing to keep in mind, if you don't know, is that when you read a totem pole, you've often probably heard the, the phrase, you know, low man on the totem pole. And that's an incorrect um, term. You read the totem pole as the bottom being the strongest. And that's the top person. So this, this bear is probably representative of this, this household's bear clan, um, most likely. I don't know. And then you'd read it up. So that's, that's very indicative of who this person and this household is and what they know and their connection with that land. So likewise, um, this was in Salish Kootenai country. It doesn't have to be just one aspect like TEK or LEK or, you know, Western science. It can be a combination of those like, you know, Venn diagrams fold into each other or overlap each other. So too does TEK and sometimes LEK and Western science. Um, when I went to Salish Kootenai country and did interviews, they were telling me everybody in the town in Polson, Montana, it's not an incorporated um, reservation like people think a reservation typically is is um, represented as. It has you know non natives and it's it's a town onto itself. So everywhere I went, you know, non tribal people, tribal people, um, visitors, you know, people who'd married in. Everywhere I went, to the gas station, to the convenience store, when I was walking down the street, everybody was very friendly. And they had sp spoken to about Lake Flathead Lake this year, you know, and they were mentioning, did you see the lake? Did you see the lake? And I was, I was taken aback because I, you know, there's not much to see. You see these beautiful pictures of this crystal clear lake, usually of what it's like, but when it's frozen over, there's not much to see. But they were very distressed about how this was the first year, and everybody was mentioning this, whether they were tribal or non-tribal, this was the first year that this lake had not frozen over completely. And you can see this in this dark spot right here in the middle of the lake. And so I took a picture of, of it the best I could. But that was a really good indication, that was my first indication actually, of traditional ecological knowledge and local ecological knowledge melding together. And they knew that something was wrong because it was too warm and this was the first year that the lake had not frozen over completely. And so that was very distressing to people. They were like, this is a change. This is not supposed to happen like this. What is going on? It was very, there weren't any answers and they had to you know, share about it because they were noting that this was a change. And so this was a really good indicator of noting some climate change impacts, those rising temperatures, the, te you know, the seasons getting longer where it doesn't get cold you know, earlier in the season, it gets cold later and it might not even get cold enough to you know, freeze or snow. So this was a really nice indicator for that. So food is an identity just as much as the landscape is. And when we look at climate change impacts through a TEK lens, we're also looking at food. Um, we're not just looking at temperatures or water levels or shade or seasonality. We're looking at the foods themselves because there are several things that occur within TEK. Remember, it's a holistic practice. It's a holistic discipline. And 
food is very much an identity for native peoples. Food has medicinal properties, food has um, spiritual properties, and there's a food for every season and for every landscape. Every landscape is, you know, has all of these food systems in it. And that traditional knowledge aspect of it, you know, tells you whatever ecosystem, whatever environment you're in will have a certain amount of these traditional foods. So that traditional ecological knowledge points to specific foods within that system. And there are foods for every reason. So looking at them, some things definitely change with TEK and climate change impacts. That TEK system of, um, you know, acorns, for example, the Siletz people used to collect acorns and make uh, Sanchantui, this acorn soup that you see in the, on the screen here, as a wedding ritual. So the bride had the option of accepting a proposal and then the man would present the dowry if she accepted it from you know, his representative, his family representative, then it was a go. It, he was all good. He was like, yay, she, she said yes, this, in essence. So then she would go back and she would get her things and she would make this acorn soup. And that was the I do, that was the kiss the bride, you know, put the ring on the finger. That was the finale, was the soup. Anymore, we don't have the oak savannas and we don't have the expansive information to be able to make this. We can't access areas. We can't get the acorns in the ways that we used to get the acorns. So that practice, that cultural practice has now since passed away. We have it and we recount it, but it's very rarely done. So that's a really changed action item for a cultural group that is really problematic. And a lot of that can be tied to um, some of the invasive species that are being, you know, supported by climate change and rising temperatures or um, others, you know, moving out of the area or not planting and surviving. Um, likewise, the things that you don't expect that climate change impacts are really, really surprising. A lot of people don't think about other aspects. They look at the hard science and they're so acclimated to Western science of, you know, the, the temperature will rise, the water will rise, or, you know, ice will melt or those kinds of things that they don't think about the cultural aspects as well. When I went down into the Great Basin, the Shoshone and Paiute people were talking about um, the elders specifically were talking about rabbit and how they ate three different species of rabbit. They had this big rabbit, this medium sized rabbit and this small rabbit. And rabbit was, not, was a traditional food system that they weren't able to eat anymore. So that was really interesting. And when I asked, they said the rabbits here are no good. They, you know, they've moved out of the area. If you get them, they're just gamey or they're wormy. And so I thought that's, you know, that really doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. But after about the fifth or sixth person, I started thinking, hmm, we better look into this in, you know, a little bit more. So what was happening is that because it's getting warmer, these rabbits don't have the, the mannerism to fend off invasive species. And so there are more and more parasites are invading the rabbits and the rabbits do migrate out and up to you know colder aspects um, geographies where they don't have to fight these parasites as much but the ones that stay in these areas are having a horrible time with with you know infestations so it's really problematic as a result um, baby blankets used to be a very common practice for these tribes and specifically the rabbit pelt baby blankets and one was gifted to every child but since these rabbits are being um, having these parasites you know flocking in on them they're no good and 
the traditional food is not as good. And so they're not being hunted and not every baby gets a baby blanket, a rabbit baby blanket, rabbit skin blade baby blanket anymore. Um, only certain tribal members who have the ability to, you know, transport to areas where the rabbits are not as infected are able to gather this traditional food and bring it back. And so it's shifting this system where everybody used to get these blankets, but now only a certain section are be, being able to, you know, be given these blankets because only certain people can afford to take time off and afford the gas and afford, you know, the, you know, hunting trips. And so that's a really interesting um, cascade effect of climate change and how it impacts all of these different systems. It's not just that this traditional food system is no longer available or that it's so um, infested with these parasites that they can't um, really eat them, but it has a social component to it as well, which wraps into that holistic aspect. And it's really important as an identity marker, that's really a, a very important aspect of maintaining these food systems. Um, a lot of tribal, a lot of indigenous groups are based within their food systems and there are foods that must be consumed for a variety of purposes. It's very much like a um, communion service where you have those wafers and that wine. If you don't have, if you have like a can of Coke, Coca-Cola, and you have a hostess donut, is that still the same thing? Is that still fulfilling your cultural or so, you know, you know, social obligation? It, it's a very difficult process. So that in and of itself is not exactly a one-to-one -one equation, but it's almost um, something that you can relate to that's on another general level. Um, so the land and its food are integral to our identity as native people and our history. There isn't really a separation of that. And then we have markers that we look to when we're looking and assessing climate change impacts through a TEK lens and for that TEK, we have these markers and these can overlap as well, or they can stand alone. So you have cultural, geographical and physical markers, which make up then that identity marker. They point to those identity markers as well, but these are the three that you're looking at. So like I talked about Flathead Lake before, this is this, these are the mountain ranges surrounding Flathead Lake. And these cultural markers are heavily relied upon for multiple aspects. Um, when I went, I was told not to come until it had snowed. And I, I was actually told, don't come because it hasn't snowed yet. Um, so Salish Kootenai people um, rely on snows to start you know, this process of timing and events and that sort of thing, which is really a key aspect of um, your cultural identity. Likewise, in the Siletz, we one of our traditional food systems is lamprey eel, and lamprey is the Pacific lamprey is a very vital aspect of who we are. Um, they no longer run lamprey eel; no longer runs in the Siletz River. They're running in Willamette Falls, and all of the nine tribes of Oregon share um, a timing season, collection season, uh, for collecting these lamprey now, but. Traditionally, we have a cultural marker from these carpenter ants, and these are known as eel ants within a lot of traditional systems. And a lot of the elders still will say, oh, I saw the eel ants, the eels will be running soon. And so it's a marker. There's absolutely no Western science correlation. There shouldn't be any correlation between carpenter ants and Pacific lamprey. And yet there is, it's the seasonality and it's the timing of emergence from these ants and when the eels actually run. So this is a really interesting aspect. And time is cultural. So one of the, the shocking things that came out of some of my research about TEK and looking at climate change through this TEK lens is that we found that time is actually a cultural occurrence. 
And so there's a different time that is a nonlinear time. And these environmental changes that are happening because of climate change disrupt that integrity of sequences that TEK is based on. So TEK is based on these long-standing information systems that have been honed and peer reviewed in essence. And that disrupts that whole understanding of that sequencing, those seasons, that seasonality, that phenology, all of these things that are occurring are now occurring at different stages and at different times and the correlations might be different. And so that's really, really, really challenging for a lot of indigenous groups. And like I said, we found that Indian time is a real occurrence. It follows environmental patterns. It's holistic in nature. It's based in natural resources and natural events. So that's a much different system than Western timing. Um, this is a 3D time rather than a linear or an abstract time. It's very evolved and, and complicated based in natural law. So it's a very different timing system and being able to read that time out in the environment is a skill that has been honed by most indigenous people who utilize TEK. So some of these things are based um, in that understanding of that timing system. So knowing how to utilize that time system and knowing what you're looking for and knowing what's changed. So knowing this should be happening, but it's not and understanding that timing is off is a cultural indicator and an environmental indicator that climate change is actually impacting some aspect of that ecosystem or that environment. Um, hunting and fishing, knowing when deer seasons are, when mating season is, when fawning season is, when rutting season is, all of those things are combined in this aspect. Down in the Great Basin, it's not just those things that you consume, it's not just traditional food systems, it's also based on other groupings. Um, this is a wild horse herd, I believe this was in Nevada, and they were talking about how up in these mountain ranges up here, there are little pools that will melt slowly, the ice will stay there, and as that melts, they know that when, when these horses come down into the valley and seek other water sources, that all of these water pools, all of these ice, ice places up here that, that then turn to water sources for these horses, these wild horse herds, are then dried up. And then based on that, they know that it's time to go get certain aspects or it's okay to go you know, foraging up there or have you know, access to certain areas. And so these are really key species that need to be supported in, and play a really big part in a lot of um, indigenous culture and indigenous populations because they are an indicator species of what is going on in the environment that you know, it takes a lot of effort to climb up a mountain mountainside and check when you know you can just look out and see oh are they running or talk to your neighbors have you seen the horses running have you seen them come down how far have they come down and so that network that social network system is very efficient in a tek system horses actually ironically ran up and down the coast and we heard of a couple instances where they there were horse herds wild horse herds up in washington that were utilized and looked to as a key species as well um, so that's a really important aspect of um, looking to your environment and cultural climate change cultural indicators. So this understanding of the land is a matter of survival. Um, there's a reciprocity relationship involved and a responsibility within that reciprocity relationship. And you have identity that's boiled down into taking care of the land and making sure that you understand how to take care of the land and the species so everybody has a sustainable environment. And looking and teaching about how this works. This is my dad and my son actually, and my dad is actually teaching my son how to read the river and what he's looking at. And so this is 
this is a picture of TEK in action. And I just couldn't resist. I was like, okay, we have to take a picture of this. So Shuasha Nula, I'm, I'm so grateful that you spent um, your time with me today. And um, I would love to hear from you if you're interested in Ocri and what we do or information about reports that we've done or information that, that facilitates climate change. If you're interested in any kind of aspect, any anything that facilitates climate change in the West here, you just look us up at Acre.net right here. Um, if you're interested in my tribe, the Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians, here is our website here. Um, you're welcome to email me at schismhatfield at oregonstate.edu. And you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. So I really appreciate you being here and I will hopefully hear from you later. Thank you so much. <laughs>